Let's do another proof by induction. This time we're going to prove that for all natural numbers n, n cubed minus n is divisible by 3. So the claim is that for all natural numbers n, n cubed minus n is divisible by 3. So let's do a proof by induction. As usual, the first step is to check n equals 1. So let's have a look. We get 1 cubed minus 1, which equals 0. 0 is definitely divisible by 3. So now let's do the induction step. So we assume it's true for n equals k. So we that k, so we're going to assume that k cubed minus k is divisible by 3. So now let's look at n equals k plus 1. Well, what's k plus 1 cubed minus k plus 1? Because you've got to put n equals k plus 1 into here. Right, so I put n equals k plus 1 into there. Well, let's write that out, shall we? It's k cubed plus 3k squared plus 3k plus 1. Remember, when you expand a cubic, you get 1, 3, 3, 1 as your coefficients from Pascal's triangle. So that's the first bit. And then you just, oh, it's a minus, minus k plus 1. Well, we know that k cubed minus k is divisible by 3. So let's reorganize this to get k cubed minus 3 together, minus k. So there's that bit. Now what's left? We've got 3k squared plus 3k plus 1 minus 1. Okay. So we've got all together k cubed minus k. And then over here we've got 3 times k squared plus k. Because this bit cancels out. But look, we know that this bit is divisible by 3 because that was our assumption. And we know that this bit is divisible by 3 because it's 3 times something. So it's true. So this bit is divisible by 3 by assumption. So the whole thing is true. So the result is true true for uh, true for k implies true for k plus 1 that was the induction step so by induction the result is true for all natural numbers m. So I'm going to put my little box here because I'm done. Now I'm going to tell you a secret. We didn't need to use induction to do this at all. I'm going to show you a sneaky little way of doing it without using induction. In fact, the previous one didn't need induction either. So let's have a look at the previous one as well. We've got time. Yeah. So in the previous one, the previous one was n squared plus n is even. Well, n squared plus n is the same as n squared plus n is the same as n times 
times n plus 1, right? But these are two consecutive integers. This is an integer, and this is the next integer up. These are n and n plus 1 are two consecutive integers. And if you take any two consecutive integers, one of them has to be odd, and the other one has to be even. So if you multiply them together, you've got to get something even, right? That was kind of easy, wasn't it? So one of them must be even. Odd. One must be odd, and the other even. Now this is a bit sneaky, because we don't actually know which of these is odd and which of these is even. If this one is odd, that one's even, and if this one is even, that one's odd. But in either case, when you multiply them together, you get something even. So the product is definitely even. Now we can do something similar for this first one as well. Let's see what we can do to the first one. What is n cubed minus n? Well, if we take the n factor out, we get n squared minus 1. And we know that n squared minus 1, it's a difference of two squares, right? So it's n plus 1 times n minus 1. So this is the same as n times n plus 1 times n minus 1. Now, I'm just going to reorder those factors a little bit. So we've got n minus 1 times n times n plus 1. Now, does this remind you of anything from the previous one? These three numbers are three consecutive integers. Now, if you take three consecutive integers, one of them has simply got to be divisible by three. Right? Because if the first one isn't divisible by 3, then the remainder, when you divide by 3, is either going to be 1 or 2. And if the remainder is 1 in this one, then the remainder will be 2 in that one, and then this one will be divisible by 3. The other case is if this one is remainder, has remainder 2, then that one will have remainder 3, or rather it will be divisible by 3. So if you take any three consecutive integers, because as you go up the integers, every 3 is divisible by 3. That one's divisible by 3. That one's divisible by 3. That one's divisible by 3. Okay. So if this is, say, this one's divisible by 3, that one has remained 1, this one has remained 2. This one is divisible by 3, that one has remained 1, that one has remained 2. This one is divisible by 3. So if you take any 3 in a row, you're doomed to include one of these ones, big ones I've written as being divided by three. I wonder if that's visible on the screen. If you take any three in a row, you're just going to get one of these. So again, as long as one of these is divisible by three, when we multiply them together, the answer is definitely going to be divisible by three. So now you can ask yourself, what was easier? Was it easier to prove it like this, or was it easier to prove it by induction? It's an interesting question. Personally, I think that this one requires a bit more thought. You have to have some understanding, right? You've got to be able to reason about the numbers a bit. With the other one, we just fiddled around with some algebra, and it felt a little bit more like cheating, maybe. But we didn't have to think quite so hard as long as we under... Oh, time's running out. We didn't have to think quite so hard as long as we understood how to do proof by induction. So you can decide for yourself which one you think was easier. We might do some more complicated examples later where we really can't think of ways of proving it except using induction.